I'm speaking on behalf of Mal Nesheim on the internationalization of obesity, and we're going to, our paper is about a somewhat different look at uh, the kinds of work that Pear has inspired, uh, and we're going to use sugar sweetened beverages as an, ex as an example. Um, it's an enormous honor for me to be speaking at this symposium. Uh, Pear has been an in inspiration in many, many ways, and I'll refer to some of them as I go along here. Um, as you've already heard, the big global food system issues um, in the world today, ranging from agriculture all the way to public health, are food insecurity, obesity, and underlying both of those uh, are their common causes in food system issues. And the, um, I'll just say a word about food insecurity, the current state of food insecurity in the world according to the Food and Agriculture Organization is that there are about a billion people in the world, slightly under, uh, who suffer from chronic hunger. That's down by 26 million since 2012. So this is considered an enormous achievement on the world level. Um, because there are fewer than there were a year ago, and let's hope that that lasts and continues that trend. On the obesity side, roughly the same number of people in the world are obese, and pretty much every country in the world is experiencing a rise in obesity. It's not just the United States. It's every country that's looked at, except the poorest countries in the world. And it's not only adults, it's also children who are becoming more obese. Um, I put arrows at the year, at, at the sort of the baseline year, that's 1980, um, and almost all of the analyses of the rise in obesity start with 1980, because beginning in 1980, a lot of things changed. Uh, one of them was uh, globalization itself, an enormous increase in technology, and deregulatory policies that greatly favored big business, and these, included these include tax and anti-union policies policies, and one deregulatory policy after another. All of these are food system issues, um, and therefore very much in a pair's scope of research. Um, what's interesting about obesity is that it's now uh, very much a something that is attached to poverty. It never used to be. It used to be that obesity was a disease of the rich. Now it's a problem for the poor. Um, and as Pear's work explains, poverty's triple burden, undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, and obesity all together a result from improperly functioning food systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works. Pear's conceptual framework, as published in his most recent book on food policy, for developing countries says very clearly that uh, human health, the biophysical environment, the socioeconomic and political and demographic environment all conspire together to affect health um, and, this, and the health and nutrition outcomes. And the health and nutrition outcomes include both problems of undernutrition and overnutrition. So this is a very complicated situation and one that requires a lot of uh, differences in the way that a lot of us started out thinking about these issues. As, Care, as Pear puts it, the overriding framework, um, which I just showed you, where social and economical and political context is the basic cause of these problems, shows that um, the government intervention to improve health and nutrition through changing social, economic, and political context is really what we need to be focusing on. Um, and this was the kind of thing that inspired David Stukler, who's a colleague in Great Britain, and I, to, to write this paper on big food, big food systems and global health, in which we pointed out that the hungry and the obese both have as the underlying cause for those problems a food system that's driven to maximize profits. Um, and the example that I want to use for that is sugar-sweetened beverages, or as Center for Science in the Public Interest called it some years ago, liquid candy. If you start thinking about soft drinks as liquid candy, it changes the way you think about it. And the basic points about uh, sodas are are that they come in very large quantities these days. Every eight ounces uh, provides 100 calories. And if you count up the number of teaspoons of sugar, 
um, in these sodas, they range from uh, more than six teaspoons in an eight ounce soda to more than 54 in a 64 ounce soda. Um, and so the sugars are a big problem and they're being uh, introduced into the body in liquid form, which may have its own problems associated with it. These basic facts about sugar sweetened beverages are what got the New York City Health Department uh, in the last few years to do several subway campaigns to try to get people to drink less soda. Your kid just ate 26 packs of sugar, referring to a 32 ounce soda, or as the portion sizes increase, uh, you the risk for a bunch of diseases, among them type 2 di diabetes leading to amputations, will occur. And these posters have gotten a lot of attention and are part of what uh, makes Mayor Bloomberg's legacy one that has a very big public health component that I hope will be continued. The research that links sodas to health outcomes is by this time extraordinarily extensive. And there's a great deal of evidence that shows that people who drink sodas on a routine basis tend to have a higher body weights, more heart disease, more diabetes, and more of a whole bunch of other <coughs> conditions. If you are aware of research to the contrary and are thinking, well, that research really isn't as good as you're making it sound, it may have to do with the fact that the soda industry has been diligent about funding research showing just the opposite. So just within the last few months, I've collected a bunch of studies that have been funded by Coca-Cola, one on the validity of uh, national nutrition surveillance data that links soda to obesity it has no validity according to soda industry sponsored studies. The results of nutrition um, and obesity studies in literature are overstated. And when it comes to diabetes, the sugars in soft drinks are harmless. Um, that sponsored research and it has really focused a lot of attention on the whole issue of sponsorship. Um, the soda industry is well aware that obesity poses an enormous risk uh, to its financial bottom line. Soda companies, in fact all companies, have to report to the Security and Exchange Commission every year on the risk factors that most influence or are likely to influence their profitability in the upcoming year. And Coca-Cola at the end of December last year listed obesity as the number one risk factor um, because if it and other health concerns may reduce demand for some of our products. Now, the soda industry has every reason to be worried about uh, concerns about health. Over the last decade, sales of sodas in the United States have gone way, way down, have flattened out, and are actually declining, whereas sales of sodas in internationally have gone up by a very, very large amount. And that is so, that situation is so obvious. If you can't sell it here, you have to sell it there. Uh, and the, the soda industry has known for decades that this was a problem that they were going to have to solve, and if they wanted to grow their product, profits, they were going to have to move internationally. And this was a statement by the head of Coca-Cola in 1991, Willie Sutton, Rob Banks, because that's where the money is, we're selling sodas overseas because that's where the population is. Um, so the, you can look at uh, the business pages of the newspapers over the last several years, and I've started collecting these things, um, where soda companies are reporting their profits based on overseas sales. So PepsiCo profits nearly doubled on sales of overseas beverages. Coca-Cola is selling lots and lots of its products in Asia. And just within the last few months, Coca-Cola has opened up Myanmar as a new market market for its products. PepsiCo is working to crack Vietnam's beverage market. These are countries that have never had any exposure to these kinds of beverages. And Coca-Cola is going to invest more than $4 billion in China over the next several years in order to open up the Chinese market to Coca-Cola. And you can easily imagine the obesity that will follow close behind. India has 1.2 billion people, but they don't drink nearly enough Coke. And PepsiCo, not to be outdone by Coke, is going to invest $5.5 billion uh, in India by 2020. They have only scratched the surface of the sales that they're going to be able to make there. 
Um, nowhere is this situation more acute than in Mexico. Mexico's nutrition transition makes it the most obese country in the world, um, where the uh, analyses show that 70% of the Mexican population is overweight and obese. That's overweight and obese. Um, with all of the expected difficulties that come with it, uh, Obesity-related re conditions have started to rise very rapidly since 1980. High blood pressure, mark myocardial infarction, and the diabetes mellitus rate, type 2, in Mexico right now is believed to be 15%, the highest in the world that's been diagnosed. And that's only what's been diagnosed. It doesn't include what is probably a very high level of undiagnosed uh, diabetes. So um, analysis, the, what has happened in Mexico is so obvious that the Wikipedia entry uh, even says what's going on. It's a relatively new problem, widespread since the 1980s, with the introduction of processed food into much of the Mexican food market. Uh, Mexicans drink more soda than anybody else in the world. Uh, last year, 163 liters per capita. That's every man, woman, and child in the country. Uh, I was in Mexico a couple of months ago and was astonished to find three liter bottles of soda. I'd never seen them before. And you could buy them for 17 pesos, which is the equivalent of $1.25. Um, Coke and Pepsi are much, much cheaper in Mexico than they are in the United States, mainly because it's they're made with Mexican cane sugar, which is produced locally and is very inexpensive. So um, Mexico, the Mexican health authorities are very concerned about this, and they have found soft drinks to be a target for trying to do something about obesity way ahead of the research, um, looking at the intake, and they're on campaigns to try to get uh, the Mexican population to drink less soda. And the dramatic thing that they did last fall was to propose a tax on sugary beverages, an, interven an obesity intervention that has really never been tested. Um, and it was interesting that the papers immediately picked up that this was a Bloomberg-like swing at soar soaring obesity rates. Mexico was going to follow in the New York City model and start some of the things that uh, Mayor Bloomberg did. Um, Forbes Business Magazine asked, why are Mexico and Mike Bloomberg battling Coca-Cola with lots of signs and ads around, if you can't succeed in New York getting a cap on soda or getting people to drink less soda, uh, let's move to Mexico, and it's framed in warlike terms. Um, the soda industry was not very happy about that, and they slammed the Mex Mexico soda tax plan, rejected any sense that they would be blamed for obesity, um, and they uh, did lots and lots of ads in the paper. These were some ads that I picked up while I was in Mexico. They were pretty funny, actually. Uh, one of them talked about how water is indispensable for life and sodas are a uh, source of uh, water and hydration. And the other did the usual one about how if there's any problem about, if there's any reduction in soda intake, <clears throat> it's going to cost lots and lots of jobs in the sugar industry and some of Mexico's other industries. But the, the most interesting thing that they did was they imported the Center for Consumer Freedom um, into Mexico. And they, the Center for Consumer Freedom is a public relations outfit uh, that it's sort of an attack dog for the restaurant and soda industry, alcohol and cigarettes as well. Um, it's interesting because they don't ever disclose who funds them, but you can pretty well figure it out. And so there they were in Mexico wrapping school buses of all things with signs saying um, that the that the tax is uh, going to be a tax on fatties and doing um, advertisements on TV saying, are you going to let a gringo tell you what to eat? Um, I have uh, been the subject of um, some of, of attention by the Center for Consumer Freedom. And this came out yesterday. It was sent to me by a colleague, Obesity Activists Fight Foreign Fat War. And they noted that in a paper to be presented to Cornell University, that's this paper, notor <laughs> notorious food scold, Marion Nestle, that's me. Uh, <laughs> 
outlines how this might look for a policy perspective, and what they say I'm advocating is the right for governments to dictate their citizens' diets. And I have to confess that that's true. I would much rather have the government dictate diets than the food industry or the soda industry. In any case, Mexican Congress passed the, uh, so the soda tax as part of a fiscal reform. It's a one peso a liter uh, tax on soda. Whether it will do any good or not remains to be seen. Um, and it is being researched. So this is an intervention pre-research that will be researched. You have to do the intervention to get the research. Um, and I noted that Mike Bloomberg tweeted um, the president of Mexico, EPN is the president of Mexico, um, for doing this. So he's right in there. Yes, Bloomberg is in there because Bloomberg is a funder of uh, activists and advocacy groups in Mexico that have worked on anti anti-soda initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, Bloomberg Funds, El Poder del Consumidor, uh, which is the most active of the advocacy organizations that are part of this alliance for uh, health. And the um, I think it's money well spent. These people are doing a great job. And they um, take a lot of credit for getting the legislator to pass the tax uh, through their series of advertising campaigns showing how much sugar is in soft drinks, how far you have to walk in order to walk off the calories in soft drinks, and how the epidemic of obesity is transmitted by lobbyists for the soda industry. Um, they have their politics dead on, and they're remarkably good. The other uh, really smart move that they made in order to get the soda tax passed was that they linked it to public health initiatives, among them providing clean drinking water in schools. Uh, shockingly enough, that's not something that exists at the moment. And so uh, the money that is collected from the soda tax will go into uh, letting kids who are in school drink water. Uh, so this is really the most exciting thing that is going on on the anti-soda front right now. And it seems to me it comes right out of Pear's work in food policy, in which his work links the global food system to health and nutrition. Um, and he says, uh, these linkages present an opportunity for people to work together. Um, and if market signals do not reflect the health and nutrition goals of society, there's a need for policy inf intervention. So Pear, you inspired the Mexican soda tax. <laughs> Take full credit for it, and I thank you very much for inspiring my work. <laughs>